Welcome back to our series on Jeremiah. Jeremiah and the faithful remnant surviving the last days. And this is study three in a series of 15 sponsored by the Christadelphian video service. This particular study is going to be about Josiah and his relationship with Jeremiah. It's impossible to consider the life of Jeremiah without examining his close relationship with the good king Josiah. They were both very young when God moved them into service. We know that Josiah, of course, started his reign at the age of eight, but when Jeremiah comes along, Jeremiah's about 20 and Josiah's about 21. So we have two young people just at the end of their teenage years, both dedicated to trying to reform the nation of Judah so that the judgments of God would not fall upon them. So this was a very particularly interesting time. It was about five years before the book, book of the law would be found in the when Josiah was 26. So five years later, they would have the book of the law. So the first five years, they didn't even have the word of God to call on for reference. But Josiah and Jeremiah, both of them felt the need to try and work on the nation. We're going to see at the end of this study that the tremendous mourning of Jeremiah over the death of Josiah is used in Zechariah chapter 12 as the greatest example of mourning in the history of Israel. It prefigures the way the Jews will lament over the Messiah when they finally realize they crucified and rejected him. So the association of Jeremiah and Josiah is important because of the depth of that connection being used to portray perhaps one of the greatest repentances and sadnesses when the Jews have finally accept that Christ is their king. So we need to look at this connection between Jeremiah and Josiah. There's a divine epitaph that the Bible paints over this man, Josiah. This is what it says in the second of Chronicles 35, verse 26 and 27. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, and we have a lot of them recorded, but there must have been many others that God is referring to here, which demonstrate his goodness according to that which was written in the law of Yahweh. And I want you to notice that, that once he had the law in his hands, he was absolutely determined to try and make sure that that was accepted in Israel. So he was a man of the book and his deeds first and last. There's a consistency in this man's life. Behold, they're written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. So there are records, some of which we don't have, about the greatness and the goodness of Josiah. So God's written his epitaph. He's a good man. He's a man who tried to change the nation, but sadly failed because of the evil of Manasseh that had come through the generations. We noted the periods of the ministry of Jeremiah, starting in the 13th year of Josiah, when Josiah is 21, until his death at the age of 39. And then he goes through a succession of, of sons or grandsons of Josiah that sat upon the throne in the next 40 years. So in that 40-year ministry to the nation went off to captivity in Babylon, Jeremiah was prophesying there. But he had those years, the years with 18 years with Josiah on the throne. We need to go back a couple of generations into the second of Chronicles. Because in the second of Chronicles, we pick up why these things would come upon them. So let's just turn up the second of Chronicles, chapter 33. These overlapping records have to be appreciated as we read the prophets to look at the history around this time, because we have a summary in the second of Chronicles 33 as to what happened to Jeremiah and to Josiah. It says this, picking up in verse 9. And talking about Manasseh, Manasseh, of course, was the son of Hezekiah, and Manasseh reigned for 55 years. It was a terrible reign. We mentioned in the last study how he decimated the priesthood, locked up the temple, and virtually eradicated any knowledge of the Bible from Judah, and then brought in his idolatry, worshipping the gods of the nations. Let's see what happened because of Manasseh. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in verse 9 to do worse than the heathen, 
And when you think about some of the surrounding nations, that's quite a statement. Whom Yahweh had destroyed for the children of Israel. So they were worse than the Canaanites. And Yahweh spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. Wherefore Yahweh brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with feathers and carried him to Babylon. So we have the, the punishment of Manasseh. Where it says among the thorns, it's a very bad translation. It should be with hooks in his nose. And when they led people away into captivity, particularly kings, they would ensure they wouldn't run away by putting a hook through their nose like a bull so they could pull them with a chain and make sure they couldn't escape. So all the way to Babylon, he had his nose being pulled by the guards, 800 miles of that Germany. He there languished in the horrors of an Assyrian dungeon, probably being tortured. If you know anything about Assyrians' methods of torture, it must have been a very, very terrible experience indeed. But while he was there, look at verse 12. Remarkably, when he was in affliction, he besought Yahweh his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And this has to be one of the, the most magnificent repentances of all the Bible. Incredible repentance of this man. A man who'd done so much harm, so much generational damage to that nation. God forgave him. He prayed to God. He was, and God was entreated of him, verse 13, heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem to his kingdom. You know, that is one of the most amazing things you'll ever read in the Bible. Not just that this man could repent so incredibly that God would, would put him back in, on, in his throne, but that he was given up by the Assyrians and released. There's no other record in history of the Assyrians ever doing that for any other king besides Manasseh. You know, usually they were utterly cruel and destroyed all those that they had conquered. But he went back to his land and he tried to undo the evil that came from his 50-year reign. He tried to undo the spiritual carnage that he had unleashed on the nations. A nation now left with no copies of God's law to be found, with people entrenched in idolatrous worship and immorality. And what's the lesson of that? You know, Manasseh tried. He tried to, to, to reform Aim and his son, but with no success. He then went about making sure that the, the young grandchild, Josiah, was surrounded by good people. But he couldn't change the nation. He couldn't stop the train he'd let loose. There's a great lesson in that, isn't there? Once you let things go, once you bring in evil thinking, idolatry, immorality, into the ecclesia, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. You know, God would say this in the second of Kings 24, verse 3 and 4, as to why he would destroy the kingdom of Judah. Surely at the commandment of Yahweh came, up, came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh, according to all that he did. So while God eventually forgave Manasseh, incredibly forgave Manasseh, what, a, what an incredible God we have that can do that. He couldn't forgive the sins that had been committed because those sins were carried on by the people. He'd filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and Yahweh couldn't pardon that. And the people, of course, had supported him in many of these things and they were continued the idolatry introduced and so they would be destroyed as a result of that. Now, there was a prophecy that had been given many years before in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he was the man who rebelled against Solomon and took the ten northern tribes away to worship golden calves. But in his days, a prophet came, a man of God, came out of Judah to Bethel as Jeroboam was by the altar to burning incense. That was the altar to the, to the, to the, the calf of gold. And that man said this. He cried against the altar in the word of Yahweh and said, O altar, altar, thus saith Yahweh. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. You know, remarkably, 300 years before Josiah existed, he was named as the one who would destroy that altar at Bethel, who would offer the bones of the false priests upon that altar to defile it. 
And that was prophesied. You know, Manasseh's evil had so corrupted the nation that this prophecy was needed. What an incredible thing this was. You know, Josiah is, a, is an incredibly wonderful man. We're told that he made David his spiritual father. The record says that David was his father. In the second of Chronicles 34, verse 2, he was a son of David. You see, his immediate family was no good to him. But he became a son of David in the way that he behaved and the way that he thought. Let's go back to the second of Chronicles 34 and take up the record there in verse 3. In the eighth year of his reign, he began to sit upon the throne. But he sought after God, his father. So he's now 16. He later on begins in the 12th year of his reign, a purge of the land. And it rippled outwards from Jerusalem through all the cities of Judah to try and get rid of the idolatry that Manasseh had brought in. This mission became very unpopular. And he found Levites to teach. You see, he was a man that wanted the word of God to be spread through the land. And so he commissioned Levites to go and speak the word of God to the people in the various parts of the land. They had to do it from memory because there was no book of the law to be found up until this point. And in the 13th year, God gave him a divine prophet. When Josiah was 21, God sent Jeremiah on the mission to speak the words of God of condemnation and warning before even the law was found. At last there was a prophet to restore the teaching of the words of God. And together this Josiah with his intent to do the right thing and with a prophet alongside of him, they could begin a reformation in the nation. And especially working with the few, the remnant who wanted to hear the words, who wanted to obey the laws of their God. The good figs that were there to be found in Jerusalem at that time. But without a Bible, it must have been so hard. And we're told in Jeremiah 3, verse 10, that because the king made these laws about what they could and could not do, the people followed the laws because the king said so, not because their hearts were in it. And so we read in Jeremiah 3, verse 10, that they obeyed these things faintedly. They just did what the king said, but they didn't really believe it, and they didn't want to obey it. All that happened by Josiah's early reforms was to drive the idolatry underground. He couldn't change their hearts at that particular point of time. And then we come in the 18th year of Josiah, when he is now 26, to a most remarkable event. They began repairing the temple and a scroll is found. It could have been the whole law of Moses. It could have just been the book of Deuteronomy. Whatever it was, it clearly indicated the thinking of God. This scroll had probably been hidden by the priests as they knew that Manasseh was about to kill them, and so they sealed it up somewhere in the temple. And only as they began to repair the walls of the temple did they find this scroll. And Shaphan the scribe was given the scroll because as a scribe he could read the ancient Hebrew. And he brought it to the king. And as Josiah was listening to the words of God being Spoken by Shaphan, he was appalled to realize how far the nation had slipped away from God. How far Manasseh had taken the thinking of the people away from the things that are true and right. And he was greatly moved. He read his garments. He was in great tears of distress at realizing how far they were away from God's ways. And so he sent the scroll on to hold out the prophetess in verse 14 as we read in the second of Kings 22. Let's just go to the second of Kings 22 and see the response that came from Holder. Quite an amazing response, a very disappointing response in two ways for Josiah. He was a man determined to do the right thing, and yet the message that came back from God's prophetess, Holder, was very sad indeed. And it said this, Picking up from verse 14. And Holder and Hekai the, the priest and Haikim and Akbor 
and Shaphan and Asai went to hold other prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harvest, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. And she said this, Thus saith Yahweh God of Israel, Tell the man, that's Josiah, that sent you to me, Thus saith Yahweh, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, upon the inhabitants of thereof, all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read. And he would have been reading chapters like Deuteronomy 28 about what they would suffer if they'd fallen away from God. She goes on to say that they've forsaken me, they've burned incense to other gods, they've provoked me to anger. Therefore, at the end of verse 17, my wrath will be kindled against this place, it shall not be quenched. And the king which sent me, thus saith Yahweh, concerning the words which you have heard, and you know, verse 19 is, is a really, really sad verse to us as humans. That king, she said, that king is an act of mercy by God. That king, she says, verse 19, because, she said, because your heart was tender, because you humbled yourself before your God, when you heard the words that I spake against this place, that it should become a desolation. I've heard thee, says Yahweh. And in verse 20, we have one of the most unusual but remarkable things where God says, as an act of mercy, I'm going to let you be taken in death. You know, what an amazing thing to say. Because he was humble, because he was tender, because God heard him, I'll gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall I see the evil of upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Just think about what that actually meant to Josiah. It would meant that his work of reformation was going to be cut short. It meant that many of his children would probably be part of the evil that would come upon this place. And maybe his grandchildren, they certainly were. And God didn't want him to see what was going to happen to his sons and grandsons because Nearly all of them came to a horrible fate one way or another. And God says, as an act of mercy, because you are such a good king, because you do want to reform the nation, because you do want my word to apply, I'm going to take you away into death. You know, what a difference there was between Josiah and one of his sons, Jehoiakim. He was a man who trembled at God's word when he heard it. He was a man who was determined to try and apply it wherever he could with the people of that nation. His son Jehoiakim would be totally different. Just by way of contrast, just think what happened when Jeremiah and Barak read the words of God through the voice of Jeremiah that had been written out on a scroll. This is what happened when Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, got hold of that scroll. It came to pass when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with a pen knife. Cast into the fire that was on the hearth until the whole roll was consumed in the fire that was upon the hearth. Josiah trembled when he heard the words of God being read to him. Jehoiakim burnt them. What a contrast. What a difference to his father was King Jehoiakim. You know, this Jehoiakim was a terrible man. But Jeremiah responded differently. I want you to come to Jeremiah chapter 15 because Jeremiah tells us in one of his very low moments how he responded to the finding of the word of God in the days of Josiah when Josiah was 26. You know, Jeremiah responded this way. He says, thy words, in verse 16, thy words were found and I did eat them. He devoured them. You know, what a difference to Jehoiakim. Both Jeremiah and Josiah had the same thing. They devoured the word of God. And thy word was to me a joy and rejoicing of my heart. They were inspired. They were lifted up by the things that they read. And what really inspired Jeremiah was to find that God's name, Yahweh, was part of his name. You and I share a common name, he says. I am called by thy name, and not only in his name, but in the fact that he'd now been called to be God's spokesman. He was God's representative in these days. 
But once the words were found, once he had the Bible in his hand, he knew he was saying the right things. And so he says in verse 17, as a result of him having the word of God and devouring it, he couldn't go to the assembly of those that made merry. He couldn't join in the fact that people were having festivals and feasts. He couldn't rejoice. He sat alone because of God's hand upon him, because he was filled with indignation. And you see, once you have the word of God clearly explained to you, you see evil for what it is. You understand the things that God hates, and you see what must be rooted out. And Josiah and Jeremiah both saw those things, and they were filled with indignation against them. And we know what Josiah did. He went on a campaign to try and cleanse the land. He got rid of the house of the Sodomites. He got rid of the idols in every place. And you can go through the second of Kings 23, colouring in the word he and what he did, how he took out this, he took out that. In verse 1 to 4, how the king led the way in getting rid of all the things that were offensive in that land. How in verse 12 of the second of Kings 23, he dug out and crushed the idols that had been restored after Manasseh's purge. You see, Manasseh had made one mistake. He put the idols into storage. If you've got something that's a temptation, you don't put it in storage because one day it'll come back to haunt you. You've got to do what Josiah did with the idols. He put them and crushed them to ashes. He banned superstitious things. And he got rid of a whole list of very ingrained sins that came from the time of Manasseh. He did all one man could do. He forced changes upon the people, but he couldn't change their hearts. One of the sad comments you hear about Josiah sometimes is that to holiness, you can't legislate holiness, people say, and that's true. He changed laws, but he didn't change hearts. But God admired his attempts. God admired the leadership he tried to show, the example he gave to the people. Their lack of response was their condemnation, not Josiah's. To make a stand for good and right ways often receives little enthusiastic response, but it has to be tried. It has to be done. God loved Josiah. All that he did and his goodness, says God, because he was a doer of the word. And Josiah wasn't just an uncompromising reformer. reformer. He tried to educate people. He encouraged the teaching priests, it says in the second of Chronicles 35 and verse 2. But the last 13 years of Josiah's work remained silent because Jeremiah has taken over the stage. What we do have, though, is a glimpse of the character of Josiah in those last 13 years. And it comes up in the most strange place. It comes up in Jeremiah 22. It was part of the condemnation of Jehoiakim we'll look at in a future class. But Jehoiakim was condemned where the prophet uses words comparing him to his father. Jehoiakim was noted for living in opulent palaces. But the comparison is made in these words. Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And it was well with him. So you see what that's saying is, Jehoiakim, you have a great palace. You have hundreds of people eating at your table. You put on great dinners for everybody. Your father was content with an ordinary life, a plain life. But he did judgment and justice. He did that which was right, and it was well with him. He looked after the poor and the needy. What a contrast that was to Jehoiakim we're going to see, that he robbed people. He didn't pay his tradesmen. He was oppressive. He put high taxes upon people to pay for his, his, his palaces. Well, Josiah, his father, was different. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. It was well with him. And why did he do it? Because he knew God. He understood God, that God cares for the poor and needy. You see, he was showing God manifestation. He was showing the character of God in the way that he behaved, even though he was the king. And we pick up the words of Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17 to 19. Amazing words because it's one of the longest lists of the divine name and titles you'll ever come across in the Bible. All of them elevating God as the, as the creator, the eternal, the powerful God, a mighty God and a terrible God. One is never moved by people's opinions 
or by preference to people. God does that which is right always. But it's immediately followed by this. He executes the judgment of the fathers and the widows. And the great and the mighty creator, the God of justice, the God of judgment, looks after the poor and the vulnerable, as his law so much shows in so many laws that he gave. And you see, Josiah was showing God manifestation in doing judgment and justice and caring for the poor. Well, that's the story of Josiah. There is an epitaph over Josiah. The rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness, according to that was written in the law of Yahweh, his deeds first and last, behold, they're written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And they were written because he died young. He died at the age of 39. Let's pick up the record about his death in the second of Chronicles 35. We need to do this because so much of Jeremiah's sadness, so much of Jeremiah's loneliness that he felt through the rest of his ministry was because of the very tragic death of Josiah. Remember, it was an act of mercy that he would not see the evil that would come upon his people and upon his family. But nevertheless, it was an incredible heartbreak for Jeremiah. So picking it up in Jeremiah, in 2 3 Chronicles 35, and it says this in verse 23. The archers shot at King Josiah. And I just noticed we're told that he was killed by an arrow. Just put that away in the back of your mind. And the king said to his servants, have me away for I am sore wounded. He took him out of his chariot, put him on the second chariot that he had, brought him to Jerusalem and he died. So he probably died of loss of blood, of infection because of that arrow. So he was in Jerusalem when he died. And he was buried in the of his fathers. And all Judah and Jer Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. You know, what an amazing thing. We don't know why he went out to fight against Pharaoh. He didn't need to do that. He went out against overwhelming odds. He did not go out because God told him to. He went out in disguise. Whatever it was, he was allowed to be killed because God had decreed that he would die young and be spared seeing what was coming upon his people. So even though he died at Megiddo, there was a great mourning because people knew that this wound would be fatal, but he eventually died in Jerusalem. They brought him to Jerusalem and he died and was buried there. Everybody mourned because even those who resented his rules, who resented the removal of their idols, they understood that this was a great man. It was also a tragedy because they could see that his older sons were being very nasty individuals that would take over the throne and they were going to see how horrible they could be. So all the people were lamenting greatly for Josiah. He was a good king. Everybody knew that. But there was one man who mourned far more than all of them, and that was Jeremiah. Look at verse 25. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. The singing women and men spake of Josiah and their lamentations to this day and made them an ordinance in Israel. Behold, they're written in the lamentations. They lamented. You know, that's a word that's used of David's grief over Jonathan. Let me imagine the outpouring of heartbroken grief from the words in the mouth of Jeremiah, totally distraught and shattered by the loss of this friend this co-worker in trying to reform the nation. And Jeremiah knew that the only hope of reformation had been with Josiah on the throne. And now he was gone. And the two older sons were very disappointing in what qualities they were showing, as we'll see in later studies. And we're told that Jeremiah's grief was written into the Lamentations. And we can find them. You see, Jeremiah felt the arrow that had killed his friend Josiah had also gone through him. Look what he says in Lamentations 2 and verse 4. He hath bent his bow, talking about God and what God had brought upon him. He's bent his bow like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary, has slain all that were pleasant to the eye. In the tent of the daughter of Zion, he hath poured out his fury like fire. And Jeremiah struggled to understand why God would 
shoot an arrow through Josiah that also would wound him in such a terrible way with the loss of his friend. This pleasant to the eye, this one that was loved by everybody, suffered the vengeance of God in that arrow. And then again, in going forward to, to that, we look at what he says in Lamentations 4 and verse 20. The breath of our nostrils, the anointed of Yahweh, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we should live among the nations. You know, Jeremiah's hope that with Josiah on the throne, that they would survive amongst the nations and not be carried away captive as they were to be. They hoped that there would be a reformation that would save them from doom. But now it was gone. And the very breath of their nostrils, the one that gave them life, the one that God had anointed to sit on the throne of David, was taken as an animal falling into a pit. You see, there was the tragedy of the loss of Josiah. And the mourning of Jeremiah could not be compared to any mourning, even of that of the people. It was far greater. He lamented and lamented for the loss of Josiah. And I believe that happened all the way from the valley of Megiddo, where he was hit with that arrow to when he died in Jerusalem. Well, look how that's used in the book of Zechariah. And we're talking here about the time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to the Jews and shows them the wounds in his hands. And this is what God says will happen in that day when Christ comes to the Jews in the future. I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They shall look unto me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one is in bitterness for his firstborn. And that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadad Driman in the valley of Megiddo. And you see, that's where the mourning began when they put him in the chariot to take him back to Jerusalem. And perhaps Jeremiah tried to keep him alive, all the way knowing this was probably a fatal wound as his blood gradually drained away. The mourning of Hadad Driman in the valley of Megiddo. And you see, that's how great was this mourning. The fact that God uses that to portray the incredible repentance, sadness, grief, horror, as the Jews realized they crucified their Messiah. The fact that that is used to portray that future event just shows you how great a mourning and a tragedy this was to Jeremiah that his friend should be so taken away. Well, there are many lessons we can take, can't we? from this time of Jeremiah. Remember what he said in Lamentations, Yahweh is good to those who wait for him, for the souls who seek him. It is good for a man that he should quietly wait for the salvation of Yahweh. It's good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. And those youthful days were spent in lovely companionship with Josiah. And that's why the Bible says to young people everywhere, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, or the evil days come not. For Jeremiah, the evil days were about to come as Jehoiakim would ascend the throne. Well, there are great lessons, aren't they, to be had from this. Let's learn from Josiah that he executed judgment and justice, that he cared for the poor, that he worked to inspire the faithful remnant. And let's see from his death that God has an, an eternal perspective. For Jeremiah, losing Josiah was a great human tragedy. And we would think that dying at 39 was incredibly young for him to die. But let's understand that in God's eyes, in God's eyes, all he's done is to translate Josiah and preserve him for the kingdom. He took him away, not to see the evil that was coming. And God does that with many saints who die quite young. He takes them away that they should not see some of the evils that are coming. And they rest from their labours. And the words of Revelation 14 are beautiful, aren't they? This is the patience of the saints. They that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down, John. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, 
They rest from their labours and their works will follow with them. God forgets none of his servants. God is not unmindful to forget your labours of love that you've done to his servants on his behalf. Let's take encouragement that even though Josiah died young, God sees him well and truly in that kingdom. Thank you.